Welcome to the Glenn Mercer Show, where we talk all things vegan. If you're not already vegan, no worries, we'll get you there. If you are, tune in for health advice, information on climate change, and all the damage done by our most destructive industry, animal agriculture. We'll also talk cooking, theater, film, and culture. My two reasons for starting this podcast, to entertain, to inform, and to make people vegan. Oh, that's three. Shit. Welcome to the Glenn Mercer Show. You can find us across all your favorite podcast platforms. You could find us on YouTube. Please subscribe. You could find us at realmeneatplants.com. I've been very much looking forward to meeting our guest today. Jeremy Lalonde has two careers. He has a plant-based career. He has a showbiz career. Jeremy resides in Toronto, Ontario, where he was awarded with Now Magazine's Best Local Filmmaker Reader's Choice Award. His films have screened internationally uh, all over the world, Glasgow, Brussels, Santa Barbara, Toronto. Um, he is a four-time Canadian Screen Award winner, three-time Canadian Comedy Award winner, and a winner of the Directors Guild of Canada's Best Direction in a Comedy Series. And in addition to that, he's currently readying his eighth feature film and developing several properties for television. But then there's his plant-based career. Mm. He's got a website. Uh, called pbwithj.ca. The CA stands for Canada. And he's got a YouTube channel, uh, again, pbwithj. Jeremy, so good to meet you. You as well, Glenn. Thanks for having me on. Jeremy, you apparently lost about half your weight. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I was, I clocked in probably at my heaviest around 360 pounds, uh, and now I kind of float around 190, 200 and change, depending on the season and whether or not I'm enjoying treats too much. Well, 360, I would say, is too much weight unless you're about nine feet tall. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, uh, my uh, my body felt the same way. Now, were you overweight all your life? When did this weight problem begin? You know, it was just, uh, yeah, pretty much all my life. Like, I, I went through a period in high school where I was in pretty good shape because I played football. Uh, and because we just had, we, we had, like, practice after school every day for three hours. And so, you know, that, that'll do it to you. And then I also had the metabolism of a teenager, right? right. But then the problem was when I stopped playing football, I didn't stop eating the way I ate when I played football, which was just like, you know, eating like an idiot teenager who feels like you're invincible. How, how I, much how much uh, did you weigh when you played football? Oh, you know, I never back in those days, I never weighed myself. I wasn't paying yeah. any attention to it at all. Yeah. Like it, and I was on the line. Right. So you're expected yeah. to be a bit bigger and a big, big bulky. So basically, like, your job as a lineman was just to push your weight into the other big guy's weight. Yeah, yeah, I was the center on the offense, but because of that, uh, you're also ha you also have to be the only guy on the line that has half a brain because you need to remember all the plays too because you're working with the quarterback. Yeah. So that was my big guy with a with a bit of a brain was 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 my role. Here's what here's what I hate about football, and this is why I can't watch it anymore. There will be a great play. It'll be you know it'll be the fourth quarter, a minute left. You know, a team with the ball is five points behind and the quarterback will scramble and then he'll throw the ball 70 yards down the field and a, a, a wide receiver will outmaneuver the defensive back and he'll jump up and he'll catch the ball with one hand, get his two feet just into the end zone. This amazing play that you, you it just boggles the mind and then, oh, flag down on the Ugh. field holding and it's some guy in your position on the line that allegedly held someone else and the whole thing gets called back and i say i'm watching baseball yeah and it had nothing to do with the play that went down anyway it wasn't like it actually stopped anything that would have happened and and they could call holding any play they want there's always yeah. holding isn't there 
Kind of. We were just trained. Our, our coach drilled it into our heads. Keep your hands flat. Like never even like flex your fingers because it can look like holding. So we had mm-hmm. to like palms. It was like push with your palms basically was how our coach trained us to, to get around that. Mm-hmm. But so, uh, so how many years did you play football? Just through high school, uh, just for like two or three years in high school. And then I got the drama bug. So I was, I was, mm-hmm. I was also that football player who was also in the drama, drama club. Um, and you know, acting and, and writing and directing and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I also had two careers that kind of contradicted each other in high school as well: <laughs> the jock and the and the drama nerd. Where were more of your friends? I, I was like, I grew up in a small town called Cayuga, Ontario, and it wasn't like you know, the cliques. I, I never felt like my high school had like massive cliques. There was a lot mm-hmm. of ble- bleeding over between groups, and okay. so I never felt like there was any like ostracization for being in two different groups like that. There was, there was a fair bit of blend between all the different things. And I was also in student council and that kind of stuff, but, but I enjoyed it. It was just like, it was a way for me to get exercise that I enjoyed, which I think all these years later, I found my way back to of just going, Oh, right. I don't really like to exercise. I like having exercised, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, but I love to move. I love sport and I love playing a game. So if I can find ways to, to move and be active in a way that feels fun, it, it's effortless and I'll do it for hours on end. But, you know, send me to a gym for, for 40 minutes and it just feels like torture. Yeah. Um, so you were overweight, but you were in good shape because you were a football player. And then at what point did it get more serious? Yeah, I think it was, it's just, I, you know, I, for me, and I'm sure you, you probably have a similar path where I just went, well, I want to work in the entertainment industry. And that's, that's a full time, that's more than a full time gig. That's a 20, 20 double time gig just to break in and, and make your mark. And so I, you know, just didn't put any priority on anything other than that. And so, you know, exercise and eating right, I just didn't kind of think about it until, uh, you know, many, many years later, I found a lovely, um partner and and you know we got married and and she and I we had our first kid and then I started to realize oh I'm I'm having a hard time keeping up with a one and a half year old like this isn't good like I want to be able to play with my kids and also I'd had bouts about every like six to eight months where I'm like I need to get in shape and I'd do a really half-ass effort into doing so <clears throat> what would you do oh like I joined a gym you know and I'd pay that like one one year down payment to like go i'm going to punish myself by if if i don't go enough then it's i'm financially punishing myself by not going but then so I you were make... over 300 pounds and you were going to exercise your way out of it yeah and so and i you know and i think i just j- did the thing i'd been doing the whole time anyway was just justifying that it's like well i have to i had to put my family first my career first and you know if i and especially because our kids were really little at that point my you know I'd say things like, well, if I, you know, spend an hour at the gym every day, well, that's an hour I'm forcing my wife to do extra work that I could be helping out with, right? So it's just, but it was all just a way of me justifying, you know, not putting my health first and foremost. Uh, And at that point, I was already a vegetarian because my wife has been vegetarian most of her adult life, if not into her teens. And so I went more pescatarian when we got married, uh, just because I started to read more and and learn more especially about the environment and whatnot and i just you know had a hard time justifying eating the way i was eating but i hadn't gone fully the way i am now just yet because probably like a lot of people someone i just talked to this morning i liked the food i was eating and the flavors i was putting into my mouth more than i cared about what it was doing to the environment and my body Mm -hmm. and so what what changed Again, yeah, so it's just like little kids just going, you know what, I'm not getting any younger. It's not going to be any easier to lose this weight if I don't start now. Uh, and then just also, you know, the thing I tell a lot of people is like, you know, there's three pillars to, you know, health and weight loss. And it's, you know, you got to change the way you eat, you got to change the way you move. But the most important thing, uh, and the other two won't happen if you don't do this one, is you just have to change the way you think. And I finally got it in my head that I'm like, I need to actually want to do this for reasons that are permanent and long lasting, as opposed to just telling myself I should do it. Uh, And so I just forced myself to get more educated about it all, right? And looked at other people that had had 
you know, extreme weight loss in a healthy way. Uh, and, you know, people like people, other people in the entertainment industry were at the first and foremost for me for people like Penn Juliet and, you know, he, Kevin he ate potatoes. Yeah. And Kevin Smith and one uh, Penn Juliet reading his book directly led me to um, Dr. Furman and Dr. Greger and all those guys and, you know, the potato diet and all that kind of stuff. And that just led me to go, oh, well, I'm already close to eating plant-based and whole food plant-based. It's like, what if I just give this six months? What if I give it six months where I eat this way exclusively for six months? I, I force myself to have like an hour of, you know, moderate to intense activity every single day. And if after six months, I don't see a change, then I was clearly meant to be in this body for the rest of my life. And I accept that. And of course, that wasn't the case at all. Like the, mm. the weight just fell off. I was I lost about 10 pounds a month. And it didn't starting really... at 350 or so. No, by that point, um, you know, just being with my wife, who is already a much healthier person than I was, um, mm -hmm. like over the course of our relationship, by the time I started this, I was probably around 315, 320. Okay. So I'd already kind of shed 40 pounds just naturally through that. Um, yeah. And so I just, it just started to fall off for about, and, and, and kind of kept up at just a rate of like at least, or but at an average of 10 pounds a month. Now you were lucky you didn't have any serious health problems, did you? No. And that's just it. Like I was, you know, how old was I at the point, at that point I was in my mid, mid thirties and I, you know, I didn't have a doctor screaming at me yet. I wasn't like having any kind of heart issues or I was, I was still in good shape. So I didn't have a health scare yet, but I'm, I, I'm sure I was only a couple of years away from that. Sure. You know, if I hadn't have shifted things, I, I, I was just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty proud of myself that I kind of get it, got into my head on my own without a doctor having to tell me to do it. Right. Now, did you know to avoid oil at the same time that you were avoiding dead animals? Yeah, because all the stuff that I was reading was all within like the realm of whole food plant based. So the first thing I learned was just like, well, oil is the, you know, and I saw that chart one day of like, you know, 100, you know, one tablespoon of cow of oil is equivalent to this much food in other groups. And I was just like, that's insane. I'm like, I, I'd much rather eat 100 raspberries <laughs> yeah. or, or a banana or whatever. And, you know, because I started off by, you know, kind of approaching science to my weight loss. And I and much to my like chagrin now, uh, I was calorie counting because I was like, well, if I can gamify it a little bit, I'm like, you know, calories in versus calories out, 3,500 3, calories is a pound and, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, and so I'm glad I did it because what it did for me was it, it made me understand calories as like a currency and to go, oh, this is the value of this and whatnot. And so when I, you know, discovered that oil thing, I was like, well, shoot, I, if I'm cutting out calories anyway, I'd rather have that slice of whole wheat bread than have a, you know, put a little bit of oil on my salad or, and, and also it's just, yeah. it's so easy to eliminate it. Like yes. I haven't, you know, I do so much baking and cooking and, and the only time I ever use a little bit of oil is maybe a little bit of sesame oil. And that's purely for flavor in like a stir fry. And it's maybe like a teaspoon on the whole thing just to add a little bit of flavor. And I'm like, if four people are eating that, I can justify the, you know, 10 calories we're each consuming from it. Um, now, did you like to cook before you made this transition? And did that change? Yeah, I always liked to cook. And I, I, but I think, you know, as a kid, I loved to cook. My mom was a big cook and my, my grandmother. And but I think just like all other things in my life, when I kind of focused on, you know, working in entertainment, I just kind of let that all fall aside. You know, and it wasn't until I, I got married and my wife and I, you know, shared cooking duties and whatnot. And I got and I got kind of reintroduced my love for cooking and being in the kitchen and playing around. But definitely when I decided to make this this change, I just really found I, I just became super passionate about spending time in the kitchen and exploring and playing. Because, again, it, it, it felt like a science project and in my brain. I was like, how do I take all these foods I love and make healthy versions of them? Right. Because I'm like, I don't, I don't want to change the way I eat, you know, from the ground up. I'm not going to start suddenly just snacking, eating kale and that's it, you know, or whatever it is. Like, I still want to be able to eat, you know, the foods that I grew up with that I love. But I'm like, there's got to be a healthier way, you know, as, as my taste buds change and align. So, you know, just finding swaps for things like oil, like you mentioned, or, you know, finding ways to incorporate, you know, make, and just like tofu, like the stuff that you can do with tofu is, you know, I just had this conversation with someone this morning who says, well, I hate tofu. And I'm like, 
the only people I know that hate tofu are people that haven't spent enough time realizing tofu is a nothing food until you do something with it. Like it's so flavorless and there's so many different like textures it can take on. Like you just haven't tried hard enough. Hating tofu is like hating water. Oh, it's- music. It's like you don't hate music. You hate genres of music. <laughs> right, right. Now, at what point, as you're losing the weight, does the idea occur to you, you know what? I can help spread the message. I could have a website. I could have a YouTube channel, as you do. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, that wasn't the first and inf- It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to do this and try to, you know, make some money off it or, or some notoriety or whatever it is. I, I just, you know, people kept on asking me, hey, what did they just noticed, you know, I look different. I had one person I ran into at a at a industry event um, like a year after, and I'd lost I'd lost most of the weight over the course of like a year and a half. And so this person that I casually knew came up to me and said, "Hey, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but you look like a skinny version of Jeremy Lalonde." I was like, <laughs> <laughs> well, funnily enough, I'm actually the former fat version of Jeremy Lalonde. <laughs> And that and that became my that was my first. I started before I did. I called it PB with J. I called it the former fat forker. Uh, mm-hmm. And that was my first name. But then I shifted it over. But I think it's just a lot of people kept on asking me like, "What have you done? And what do you? And how is it working?" And I think I just got to the point where I felt like I was writing the same email or having the same conversation, which I didn't mind having. And I was just like, "I bet you, if I, I'm sure I could put this information somewhere and just send someone a link." to an article I wrote or a video I did or a recipe or whatever. And so I just started amassing all that stuff and decided to start turning it into something. And I was sharing recipes with friends and they were telling me how much they loved them. And these are people that, you know, aren't really that interested in eating plant-based to begin with. Mm -hmm. They just want good food that's slightly healthier. And so I, I started getting enough feedback from people saying, Hey, why aren't you doing something with this? Like we, you know, you should share this with more people. And so I just kind of slowly, got around to it. And I wasn't sure at first about like doing the YouTube stuff. Cause I, you know, I think my wife at first wasn't comfortable with the idea of our family and us being out, out in the world that way. But I think, you know, the way we do it now, she, she really enjoys because, you know, kind of the rule I made for the YouTube channel was that we just get to be ourselves. We're not going to try to be influencer you know, we're just going to be ourselves. And if it's rough and raw, that's okay. And if people don't accept that, that's fine too. And not uh, only are you being yourselves, but you incorporate your family in your videos. Yeah, not all of them, but definitely, you know, the one popular series we have that we're, we're really having a lot of fun with is doing reviews of cookbooks, you know, yeah. which we just kind of stumbled upon because I've always been a hoarder of cookbooks and, and trying to make excuses for going through them. Uh, and so we just kind of did that for fun one time and realized, oh, this really connected with people. And it also helped us kind of expand our horizons and just, you know, not just make the same 10, 15 meals over and over again, which I think a lot of people can fall into the trap of. Right. Well, what's wonderful about your YouTube channel is you're a filmmaker and it shows, you know, your your videos are easy to watch and they move around and they're edited and they're quite good. Well, thanks so much. Well, that's the other thing, too, is I think that, you know, helps our channel stand out from others is simply that is like I take it from a filmmaker's approach of like, I, you know, I understand story. I'm a writer, a director and an editor. I understand what I need for footage, you know, and and still being able to do it in an efficient way, but also just, you know, how do people keep people engaged? Cause I, you know, I did spend some time studying just other, other YouTube channels in our, in our niche over some time and just realize, and you realize I'm like, Oh, these are all full of great information, but man, some of them just bore me to tears. <laughs> and so for me, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm already, you know, in the comedy base. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I can be charming at times. I was like, let's just make that part of it. And it's like, I don't want it to feel like it's a lecture. I want it to feel fun and also like approachable. So it doesn't feel like homework. Cause I think that's the other mm-hmm. thing too, is like, you know, whenever you, you, you fall into the health realm, it's just so easy for people to, to make things feel like homework or feel like lessons to be learned. So I, you know, I always came to the approach of a spoonful of sugar. Right. Now I have not yet seen any of your films, but they are mostly comedies. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Mostly comedies. Uh, I did a drama recently called Ash Grove that just, uh, just started, uh, just got released publicly. It's available throughout, you know, North America and in, in Europe as well. And then I have another film that's just finishing the festival circuits. It's more like a thriller comedy. 
Okay. Now, you were overweight, and you went on to make comedies. Do you think the two facts are related? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think it's funny. Like, I'm not an actor by any means, uh, but definitely, like, I think, you know, in comedy, you're just allowed to actually be a human being. <laughs> you know, you don't have to be a supermodel or you know super buff it's there's something about like the real being funnier and whatnot and so i think but also just being behind the scenes i don't think there was any kind of onus either way yeah i was also thinking about the fact that it's often the overweight or obese kids who become funny because it's a way to make friends oh yes 100 percent. yeah because i and it, I don't know if I, my dad had a great sense of humor too. And so for me, I just wanted to spend my life making him laugh. And I, if I can make my dad laugh, that was a good day. And, it, and my dad was the nicest person. It is yeah. the, he's still around, uh, is the nicest <laughs> person in the world. So it wasn't hard to make him laugh, but I just, he has got such a great laugh. That it was just like yeah. my own sense of joy hearing him laugh. Uh, but also I just found that like, I think I was always like a big kid, even, you know, prior to high school and playing football, I was just on the bigger side yeah. and, and, you know, I found that it's like if some kid tried to make fun of me for my weight, I could just make fun of myself way better. You know, I come up with a joke 10 times better to make fun of myself. And then they uh -huh. slowly realized, oh, Jeremy, first of all, doesn't care if you make fun mm -hmm. of him. And second of all, he'll school you faster than you can school him. And so there's no point in making fun of him. <laughs> you know, it was disarming. So I think a lot of it came from that of like, you know, definitely some self-defense. So you, you disarm the fat shamers. But that's just it. It's like, you can't make fun of me. I'll make fun of myself. Yeah, <laughs> like, what, what are you going to do now? Yeah. You want to go after me because I'm bald now too? I'll tell a bald joke as fast as anyone can. Now, um, did you do stand-up? Yeah, I did it for like five minutes. Uh, uh -huh. And uh, I, I did it in high school for fun. I went to like legions, which in Canada are like, you know, ex-military places where they all the old like veterans hang out. Yeah. And I did that a little bit. And my most successful set, because I know you have background in stand-up. I do. And it wasn't, I was never overweight or obese, but I was, I think, drawn into the comedy world because I was never breastfed. So, <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. My, my best set I did was when I forgot my act and I had to riff and I, and I uh -huh. created a set, a 10 minute set on the spot about how I couldn't remember anything. Okay. Um, but I, but then after that set was done, I could never have recruited it <laughs> either. My worst set was at the other cafe in San Francisco where I uh, was a uh, regular uh, uh, MC. There were, at, th at that time, there were three levels of comedians in San Francisco. There were the top um, A-listers, headliners, people like Dana Carvey. Mm -hmm. The bottom level consisted of about 100 open micers. And the middle level consisted of me. I emceed the open mics. <laughs> nice. So I would make 10 bucks bringing on the open micers. Anyway, my worst set was, I thought this would be hilarious. I got a long piece of dental floss and I put it between my teeth. And so it was just hanging down there. Okay. So I had dental floss hanging out of my mouth. And then I went on stage and I did my act. You know, I did like 15 minutes of my jokes. Some worked, some didn't work. And then at the end of 15 minutes, I said, man, I've had a rough day. You won't believe it, but this morning I got some dental floss stuck in my teeth. And nobody laughed. <laughs> so I had dental floss in my teeth for 15 minutes for no reason. Uh, it's just the bit that, but com your commitment to the bit is impressive. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but I've never done that bit again. And you'll notice right now, here we are talking, no dental floss. No, you took it out five minutes in when I didn't notice it. <laughs> so um, at what point did you start making films? Uh, I always, you know, in high school, I was a playwright, um, you know, and by playwright, I mean, I had like, I did my own little theater company in the summer with all my drama school friends and, and, and we did that. But always... I always wanted to be a filmmaker. You know, I always wanted to, uh, you know, play. And I, I loved films as a kid. You know, I watched a lot of movies with my parents. And I just I felt like that was the right. Because I was, I was like writing as well, you know. Um, but I'm also probably a bit of a control freak. So I realized pretty early on that if I want to control my stuff, I should probably also direct it, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and I also like 
had the illusion for a little bit that I was maybe a bit of an actor. So I kind of understood how actors thought enough to like be able to talk to actors and communicate with actors. And that's something I'm still pretty decent at now. Um, and so I just started playing around and doing stuff on the side and, and all the way through, you know, my career coming up, I started, I came out of film school and a buddy of mine and I, that I went to high school with, we got government grants to make, um, documentaries on local history because we figured out what you could get money to make films for, for people that had no track record of success. And we're like, Oh, this grant system from this organization and this niche, we're like, sure. We can do that. What and would so, be an example of a film that you got a government grant to make? Oh, they were all, we would just literally take um, uh, counties from Southern Ontario, like Brantford County and Oxford and Elgin. Uh, and we would just do a documentary on their local history, uh, which, I mean, there's a comedy routine in there itself because we'd, we'd, we'd spend like the first couple weeks of every summer just driving around to people that were obsessed with their own local history and just hearing all their stories and reading as many books as we could and finding whatever information was available. And wow. And you heard everything from like really crazy, awesome, like murders, like true crime murder stories that happened in the area all the way to like, well, this house is important because the first post office was there and nothing has happened before or since, but it's important and you need to talk about it. And it's like, nobody gives a shit about <laughs> your post office. Um, and, and so, you know, we would do those kind of things and, and, but also it was good training for like, how do we take some, you know, kind of stale, boring material in some cases and make it pop and make it interesting. And how do we find the story in all of this mouth and what are the connective tissues that kind of tell the story of this region in this area from, you know, like anything from like war or, you know, industry and just like the, the surrounding areas. And so there's a good training in that for writing too, of just amassing materials and making, making a work with something. Right. It was, it was kind of editing in, unto itself. Did they air on television? Why yeah, not? we ended up selling them eventually to a small broadcaster called TVO, which is Television Ontario, which does a lot of like factual and documentary stuff here. But for us, it was great training ground. So when I uh, moved to Toronto uh, after film school, I, you know, kind of had my foot running out the door because I had a good resume and reel as a director and an editor and a writer. And so I kind of mostly got just started through editing for a while. And I kind of edited everything. You know, if you name, I edited in everything from Pilates videos to cooking videos to game shows, and then eventually scripted material. But, and all the while I was doing that, I was directing shorts. I was getting like small grants to do sh shorts or just squirreling away a little bit of money and just doing it on the side. Up until the point that, you know, uh, a, a buddy of mine and I tricked some people into giving us money to make my first feature. Ah, who'd you find? Dentists? No, uh, we found a company that was a post-production company that wanted to get into production. Uh, and so they needed like a cost effective way to do that. And so we presented them with this proposal that we could make a feature film for under $100,000, assuming wow. that, they, that they would provide the post for free because they were a post company, but we could get it in the can at least shot for, for a hundred thousand. So did uh, you become an expert at gorilla budgets? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you had to, right. But we were already making films that way anyway. So to extend it, you know, to, to go from like a five, you know, a two or three day short film shoot into a 15 day feature shoot, isn't that big of a difference because you're still mm -hmm. employing a lot of the same techniques. It's just a longer time frame You have to do it over. So, um, you know, we got pretty good at doing it that way. Uh, and I still love that way of making movies. I, I've gone back and forth over the, the seven feature films I've made. You know, my budgets have ranged from as low as, you know, just under $100,000 to $3 million. And, you know, I, I like the money that comes with making a $3 million movie. But there's something about that you know, tight, small, low budget film where the people are there because they love the project and it's not really about the money. That's really, really rewarding as well. So if there were a script that you wrote or, or wanted to do that was back down in the hundred thousand range, you would do it again. I literally, my film that I did, uh, I did a film during the pandemic called Ashgrove that we did for 130,000. Yeah. Uh, because we realized we could shoot it. We have a place out in the country that's been in my family for a long time. 
uh, that we realized we could shoot it all there. It's, we can all be bubbled. We don't have to worry about COVID. This is at the beginning of COVID. We started shooting it. Um, just when all the, when the restrictions lifted enough that you could get together in groups of, uh, like up to 20 people. Um, but we all bubbled. We all lived together for the three weeks and made this movie. So, uh, and, and that was one of the most creatively rewarding experiences of, of, of my career because it was just so, it was like going to camp and just like have this communal living experience that was so much fun. Um, would you say that the indie film scene in Canada is is thriving maybe more than in the United States? Oh God, is it? I don't think it's ever throve. I, I I don't know. It's it's not. It's I don't want to say it's dismal, but it's just complicated. I think as anywhere, you know. I think mm -hmm. you know nobody wants to put movies as you know this. Nobody wants to put movies in the big screen that aren't you know IP. That you know don't already have a hundred thousand followers of some degree, whether it's from a comic book or a known property, if it's not a requel or a sequel or whatever they're calling them these days. Mm -hmm. So you know, I think the indie market is is challenging. I think what I've found recently is, you know, working in more niche storytelling can sometimes be more fruitful because I think your audience is more, you know, your audience. It's kind of more accepting of 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 lower budget type films because I think the problem is, you know, especially guys like us when when we work in we comedy, it's like nobody grades you on a curve, and not to say they should, but it's like, you know, they'll compare, you know, two million dollar indie comedy up against a forty million dollar studio comedy as if we have all of the same resources and assets. Well, uh, the forty million dollar studio comedy could de be defined as two guys sliding off a cliff screaming mm -hmm. you know so uh the the lower budget ones are often better written well that's just it and so you know I, i'm enjoying it. there's a nice community here but i think just like anywhere in the world it's it's having a hard time understanding what to do right now uh in the industry where you know streaming's taking over and nobody quite i think everyone's constantly striving to catch up and figure out what to do right now yeah and it's hard on comedy because comedy works when you're sitting in a theater next to 100 200 200 other people laughing 100 percent. yeah it's 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 and, well, and that's what's fin funny i think i read a stat the other day that you know you know pre-pandemic and like sometimes the mid the mid early 2000s or even 2010s it was like 40 studio comedies were released that summer or that year and mm -hmm. last year there was seven yeah you know uh there's just and i think it's because sadly uh and i don't necessarily agree with this but you know the argument is that well comedies don't travel internationally because you know comedy is so language based and i think that's true to some extent for some comedy but not all comedy uh, and I think what happens is that they just go, well, it's just better for us to do an action movie because, or a horror movie or that. And so comedy gets left by the wayside. And I think now they look at comedy as like, well, that's for Netflix streaming or for, you know, Prime or, or any of the other streamers. Yeah. Unfortunately. But, but that's not a bad place to be either. I mean, for me, it's like, you know, to get people to go to theaters now, especially so coming out of the pandemic, I think, um, people, are more likely to go to the big 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 stuff so it's like i I'm, I'm not one of those filmmakers that feels like everyone needs to watch my film on the biggest screen possible i think that's always nice but i'd rather it be available to as many eyeballs as possible um just so that way more people can see it right which is also why i find youtube such an attractive platform because there's no gatekeeper at all I don't mm -hmm. have to like, I don't have to pitch my, my, my new video to somebody and get it greenlit and get it approved and go through 50 different cuts of it. And, you know, I can go from idea to uploaded project within a, a day or two if I, if I'm really quick on it and want to, right. you know, and there's, and then, then you get instant feedback from your audience. You know, if the video works, you know, right away. And if it doesn't, you know, right away. That's why I went into stand up after trying to write plays because I didn't have some gatekeeper. I could just make the audience laugh or put dental floss in my teeth, but I had a choice. All right, let's take, let's take a quick commercial break and we'll be right back with Jeremy Lalonde. 
All right, if you've ever wanted to show off your plant-based lifestyle and do it in style, here's your chance. We have some of the most amazing t-shirts, hats, accessories, coffee mugs, and more at shop.realmeneatplants.com. We have statement t-shirts that will bring a smile to everyone's face. I love the I want tofu tonight tea. Plus, we have podcast teas, real women eat plants gear, real kids eat plants, and real people eat plants, just in case men, women, and kids didn't cover it all. Yeah, we love you and love that you want to show off that healthy lifestyle of yours. Again, check out our high-quality gear at shop.realmeneatplants.com and enjoy. Okay, now, Jeremy, when you make films today, is the craft service table vegan? Uh, on my last film, I'm, the one that I made during the pandemic, I catered a lot of the meals because uh-huh. it, it was very, it was very home cooking, right? Um, and so you were the director slash caterer for certain meals for certain. Like, is for... that what Hollywood calls a hybrid? Yeah, <laughs> or a hyphenate? It's the sad hyphenate. It's the one where it's like, <laughs> what what am I doing with my life? No, uh, it was more. It was just like because a lot of us were staying. We we're shooting at at the the farmhouse that we have that, that you can see in the YouTube channel a lot. That a lot of the videos take place there as well. Um, but a lot of us were staying there, and it was just more of a communal meal every night yeah. that I would kind of lead. And and everyone staying there was kind of game for just eating the way I ate, and was kind of interested in trying it out as long as the food didn't suck, uh-huh. <laughs> you know. And I tried my my hardest not to make it suck, but I also got there's a small um, uh, cable provider in, in Canada called Bell that does the s- shows. And I did PBWJ started primarily through that as well as I did like a cooking series through that, that a producer friend of mine said, hey, I think what you're doing is interesting. Would you want to do a little TV series where you host? And I was like, I'm not a host. And he convinced me that I could do it. Uh and and so for that it was it was similar it was like it was a bunch of cooking videos but also we go out into the local community and visit places uh but also like my low budget mind went and also not wanting to waste food i went well how about i just like design whatever i'm going to make for the episodes around what i'll feed all the crew too and so all the food that's made on camera i made enough so that our you know we had a pretty small crew but you know that everyone could eat as well um and give me feedback on as well because pretty much well, none of the none of the yeah, crew was, was vegan i was thinking did you get feedback from the cast like jeremy you know the 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 directing is very subtle and on point but the lentils were undercooked yeah underspiced uh could use that <laughs> no i think more people they were just like kind of really curious and interested in, in what how to I think people are so mystified by plant food, which is hilarious because it's always been here. You know, yes. you know we it have is, so- in fact human food. That's just it, and you know, there's some ingredients that that are you know like stuff nut- nutritional yeast and tofu is that are you know they they they're they're somewhat processed to some extent or or you know not of the norm, but still it's just so for them like watching you know showing someone how I can turn aquafaba into whipped cream just blew their minds. They're like, just that. I'm like, don't throw that stuff out. We're going to use that. Like, the juice that the chickpea, I'm like, yes, we're going to keep that. We're going to do some delicious things with that. <laughs> and then just seeing before their eyes it fluff up and also not taste terrible. They're like, they, you know, it just blow, blew the mind, right? So I think for a lot of it, they were just kind of like, like, it was like they were watching a science experiment to some extent, right? That also tasted good at the end of the day. Right. Um, and do, do the other members of your family like to cook? Yeah, our, we were all like my wife loves to cook as well. She's a school teacher. And so she, you know, she doesn't have super long hours, but she comes home pretty tired because she, te- she teaches the little ones. Um, so she appreciates it when I'm working from home and she can come home and just either like be a sous chef or just deal with washing dishes and not have to do this stuff. But she she can whip up a storm in the kitchen and stuff. And our kids are are pretty great at it, too. Like from a young age. We just kind of had the mentality that if they helped cook, they'd be more likely to eat whatever we're eating. And how old com- are they now? Uh, now they're fourteen and eleven. And and are they plant based? They're uh, pescatarian. Okay. Um, but ni- I'd say they're ninety percent plant based, and it's just if we go out and they want to have something or like a piece of fish, and they they eat dairy still. So you know, for us, it was always like. 
you know, the meals we prepare are going to be whole food plant based. If they want to add something to it or have something on the side, we're never going to stop them because I just think that's just the that just leads to rebellion on their own side later on. Right. And I've just been really open with, you know, letting them kind of choose their own path. And we find even when they do go off and do that, they always return to our food because they, it just makes them feel better. Right. Now, you your know? wife, your wife had helped make you healthier because she was a vegetarian. And you early in the marriage lost weight and got somewhat healthier. Mm -hmm. You then went whole food, plant-based, vegan. Did she then adjust to that? Yeah. And what was interesting, we kind of did it together. Uh, in, in a way, she was actually a little bit ahead of me because she went through, like, um, over the course of like a, about a year and a half, uh, her father passed away. Our daughter was born, um, and then she was just having some weird stuff going on uh, at work that there was all these stresses that happened that suddenly something in her body chemistry shifted, and suddenly she was having all these allergic reactions to the food she was eating. And so her naturopath and her went through all these like restrictive diets and all these other things that eventually led her to basically a whole food plant-based diet that was also gluten-free because she realized she was having a, a, an allergic reaction to to gluten um and so in a way she kind of got there ahead of me by by a little bit okay. um and so we were slowly trying to turn to eat that way anyway by just eliminating uh you know she had never been into fish or anything like that but she was still eating dairy and dairy uh up to that point so we were kind of like phasing it out anyway so yeah there was so that's i mean that was all super helpful obviously as well that my partner and i were both on the 100 percent the same page and excited about eating that way Absolutely. which i know i know isn't true for a lot of people and a lot of people that write into me on my channel or my website I, I know that that's the struggle they have with like well i have to make two meals and i always say well why do you have to make two if you're only eating one <laughs> right um now, some people who, who struggle with their weight have the problem that they find certain foods addictive. Did you mm. find any foods addictive? Were there any foods hard for you to cut out? I thought I would. Like, I think for me, like eggs was my big thing. I was like, well, I like having eggs a couple of times a week. And I thought that would be the thing I'd miss. I didn't miss it for a beat. You mm. know, I also know certain blood types have, have harder challenges with some foods. I've been told I didn't. I don't um, know if I'd buy that. Yeah, I don't know either, but I can't. You know, I, I think I th again a lot of it. It's up here. It's like that mind thing. It's like if you yeah. if you've convinced yourself that that's the reason you can't shift, that's fine. But that's you well, convinced if your blood type type B. You really like bread. I don't know if there's. Any I don't know. Science it's the iron thing. I hear the iron argument that it's like, well, my blood type really needs a lot of iron. And it's like, well, there's a lot of iron in plant food. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you just got to eat the right ones and do, you have to do a little bit of research, unfortunately, and figure out what those things are. There's this, there's this amazing new device just out this year called Google that uh, yes. is a wonderful. That. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I never, I, I thought I would. I thought I'd miss like cheese and and ice creams and that kind of stuff. But even that, like, I can imagine, you know, people that ate, you know, I'm lucky that I, I shifted over to eating this way just, you know, a couple of years ago and there's so if you want to have those flavors they exist and they're pretty good facsimiles you know nice cream is just as good as ice cream i don't just yeah just using bananas is yeah. just as good for me you know, put a little cocoa powder in there yeah beautiful you know it's i don't and, and also there's just so many great you know companies that make a really good non-dairy ice cream too if you want something that's even like, even sugarier and closer to the original if, if you're still wanting that kind of food too so there's just really no excuse anymore for me yeah. now um you you told us that you were lucky that you didn't have any serious health problems when you were over 300 pounds what was your experience like with doctors when you would go in for a checkup and you were over 300 pounds did they give you any advice yeah, and it was just the standard, like, you should maybe lose some weight at some point. But I also wasn't good about going in and getting regular checkups, uh -huh. you know, because I, I think probably in the back of my head, I knew that I was just going to get a lecture about my weight. And I and I knew, and, you know, I think and no, there's nobody that's overweight that doesn't go, I know I'm overweight. I know I should lose the weight, right. you know. And I think because of that, so many people in that situation, you just avoid doctors like the plague because they're going to tell you 
exactly what you don't want to hear and that you've got to make some changes, which are never easy. So I probably avoided it for the most part. But I know that when I, what what happened was I lost all the weight and now I have all this excess skin. That's just like real, I'm starting to get rashes in certain parts of my body and going, okay, you know, what do I do? Should I have this removed? What's the process for that? And, and so I kind of looked into it and then, and I had to go into my doctor to talk about that because I had to get a referral for someone that could do that. And of course they were looking at me going, how did you lose the weight? And it, and it, and it, and that worked. (laughs) <laughs> and and well, we should check your blood levels to make sure you're actually healthy. And of course, she's like, well, you've got blood levels of someone 10 years younger than you. And all of your things are well within normal ranges. And you don't eat any meat or any, di- none of it. Huh? Like, <clears throat> you know, she's a lovely woman, our doctor, but yeah. <clears throat> she was like kind of shocked by it. And I think trying to find ways to poke holes in it, but she never did. She was really lovely about it, but definitely was like on the fence about whether or not this is a good idea, but was, but, but was definitely fascinated by it, right? This concept. And I think, you know, as you know, in all the years you've done, you know, doctors have what, like five minutes of, of you know, nutrition and nutrition think, training. <laughs> it, it's just extraordinary. I mean, they're trained to be doctors and they're not taught about health. They're well, taught about disease. Yeah, and I think it just call, falls down to their job is to fix problems, not to prevent them. Yeah, and that means they're not doing their jobs correctly. Well, if there's no problems to fix, they don't have a job. You know, is is I think is, is I think I don't think they well, they want anyone to be unhealthy. That's not what I, I want to get across. But I do think that it's like that's kind of that is that is the nature of their job, unfortunately. But people think that that means that they can ask them about health and nutrition when it's like, they're not really qualified to do that. Yeah. And and, you know, every book I write and, and, and uh, sometimes on the YouTube videos, I give a disclaimer. I'm not a doctor or a nutritionist. So, you know, consult with your physician. They can have a physician that's 400 pounds and he or she doesn't have to make a disclaimer. I know. (laughs) And they've studied nutrition less than you and I have. You know, so yeah, I used to have a joking disclaimer, but then a friend of mine that's a lawyer told me maybe remove that was it was very similar to that. It's like I'm not a doctor or a thing on like nutrition, but just so you know, your doctors don't know about nutrition either. Right. <laughs> so, so maybe right. so I'm not saying consult with them, but also maybe consult with them for legal reasons. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. That, yeah, that that's the irony. Disclaimer. Yeah, they're just human beings like anyone else. They went right. and they they learned a bunch of stuff, and they can't specialize in everything. And and right. uh, and nutrition isn't as as glamorous as some other things are, right? But I think what what the last ten years of all this new information coming out from people such as yourselves and other people in our community is just that it's like something that our ancestors knew is that food is fuel. <laughs> it's where, and 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 the closer to its source it is, the better it is for you. Shocker. <laughs> Right. Um, yeah, I mean, to me, it's really a scandal that in medical school, they they decide that the you know that they're just going to train to treat disease. They're gonna they're gonna teach doctors anatomy. They're gonna teach them about diseases. They're gonna teach them about drugs. And you know, if you're a family doctor, people are coming to you to learn how to stay healthy to not get sick. And for that not to be part of it's like if you're, you know, going to become an architect, you learn something about load bearing systems, you know, because otherwise, you don't want to build too many stories. Um, You know, it just seems to me. Well, also the most sensible, the most important job for an architect is to figure out how the poop flows through the building. Yeah. And make sure, you know, and make sure it's got a clean pattern. That's similar to our bodies. Like, how does this all this stuff? fuel through like i just know even my son we went to the the cne yesterday as a canadian national exhibition it's like a it's like a world's fair type thing and he had this deep fried thing or whatever and like an hour later he's like i i regret that so bad yeah he's like he just you know he's just like yeah he's like i wouldn't do that again yeah <laughs> you know but that's just it it's like our bodies are not designed for flow that kind of stuff to go through it it's like whether we yeah. like it or not there's a reason we feel this way we feel sluggish we feel like crap when we don't eat well. Like right. you know that the you know the Thanksgiving nap, ninety percent of North America takes. You know when it's like right. yeah, it's like your bodies aren't designed to eat and 
digest food like that in that the quantity is like that and those types of foods listen to your body right be kind, now, be kind now jeremy you are changing lives all the time by people watching your videos and going to your blog and i'm sure that must be rewarding has it also happened in in real life with friends have you gotten any friends to go plant-based yeah, I, I got to say, like, one of the most rewarding things about this, uh, and I don't know why I didn't think it would, I didn't expect it, but it's just, it's just like getting emails and getting messages on the comments page on YouTube. It's just like hearing those stories of people that have like, hey, six months ago, I started following you and I've now I've lost this much weight and this has happened. It's just like that kind of stuff is probably more rewarding than anything I've done in my other career. Right. Just in terms of knowing that, you know, this one person, their lives have shifted and changed. You know, the 70 year old woman from Louisiana who's only ever eaten soul food. She's like, yours is the first whole food plant based food I've been able to like enjoy and keep down and be able to share with my family. And they haven't hated it. And I was like, that's the best. Like, that is not a person, a demographic and a person I ever expected to, me <laughs> right. to meet, you know, and definitely in my own life, like. I definitely, ha again, like it all stemmed from that because people were like, hey, what do you, how do I do this and why, and what did you do that for? And so sharing those recipes and uh, to the point where my cousin uh, roped me into, you know, she auctioned me off to to cook a dinner party for some people next weekend. So mm -hmm. uh, so I'm doing that. And it's people that they've never eaten plant-based, you know, they think they've never eaten plant-based. There's so many foods that other people don't realize is plant-based, but it is. Um, and so I'm going to go do that next weekend. My son's going to come and help me. And we're going to cook for a, a group of six people who are, you know, you know, they're very open-minded and excited about it, but not, you know, typically inclined to eating plant-based. Now, has any of your plant-based philosophy infiltrated your film work? Yeah, I think definitely, um, you know, as I was going through this, you know, physical change. I also started going through more of like a mental change and an emotional change and just and spiritual in a way of just being more present, you know, listening to my body, listening to how I feel, listening to those around me. And so definitely like the themes and the stories that resonate with me now are, are definitely different than the, the ones that I was excited about and getting behind before that happened you know i can just see that shift and that okay. maturity in my films as well okay well that's a subtle and abstract effect are there any stories that involve vegans not yet not yet and it's not that i haven't gone out to do it but i've also i think for me i'm like and and this will probably change or, or you know in in the near future but i feel like i did i never wanted to be the person that forced myself on other people um, I just found it was better to, if someone comes to me curious, then I can really help you. But for me to like bang down your door and try to convince you what you're doing is bad for you. I just think, you know, you fall on deaf ears that way. I just think people have to want to make the change or want to know. And then I'm all, I'm, I'm all over it. Right. So, uh, yeah, so so far not not yet, but definitely like making my own TV show that was that was in the plant based realm, and, and doing the YouTube stuff. That's all a hundred percent. Tell you know. tell us about the TV show. What was the TV show? Yeah, so the TV show was that I, I mentioned a little bit earlier was that Bell Five show that you know a lot of it is now on the YouTube channel because they have a short license agreement. So um, a lot of the cooking videos that you see on my channel that are a bit kind of higher end and have multiple cameras. Uh, those are the ones that are from the Bell Five TV series we did. So it was called today. Bell Five. Bell Five is the name of the network here in Canada. Oh, okay. Um, what was the name of the show? PB with Jay. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. So just so it was just like your YouTube videos. It was you cooking and talking and 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 uh, uh, explaining things about nutrition. Yeah, so if you if you are on the YouTube channel and you see stuff where I'm at the farm kitchen uh, mm -hmm. and it's a more kind of professional setup, those are the ones that uh, I've been able to repurpose and put onto YouTube from that 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 channel. So, and there's still more coming out because we did a second season last year that now the the license is up for that that I can start putting them out on YouTube as well. So, so those ones are there. Um, and I was able to go to a lot of plant-based businesses. I went to go to a tempeh, tempeh factory and a kombucha factory mm -hmm. uh, and a, and a plant-based uh, dairy uh, company. 
I got to go in and, and see how they make all their products and work and work with them. So those all those are all parts of things that are on the show. Now you're in Toronto, correct? Yes. Um, have you been affected by the fires? Your country has been on fire. It has not necessarily here, but we definitely uh, earlier this summer. It was it was hard to walk outside for more than about 10, 20 minutes at a time without feeling that that those just that smoke and just feeling like you're at a camp. I mean, I think the first night I noticed that our windows were open and I was like, are the neighbors having a campfire? It smells like there's a campfire out, but it was 3 a.m. And then I realized the next day I was like, oh, the smoke has finally come from because it was over, not necessarily near where we live, but close enough uh, mm. that that it hit. So there was about a month there where, you know, we didn't spend a lot of time outside, unfortunately. But it, it's yeah. it's some it's subsided now. I interviewed recently a, a, a lovely couple from uh, BC, and they've been terribly affected by the fires there. It's far worse over there than it is here, for sure. The the wind I think has shifted that way, um, and not necessarily hitting us here in Toronto as much. But but it was bad here for for a couple of weeks. We have to hope that this isn't the new normal because this is very difficult. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, I think that's just it. Like, it's funny. Like, I, I feel like every single show I watch has like running jokes about how the world's on fire and, you know, it's all going to be destroyed. But it's like, I don't think they actually take it as seriously as they're joking about it, you know? And they realize that it's like, th these are real things. These are like the actual problems in our life. And I look at just like, you know, I'd love to be a grandfather, but uh, but I just go, I don't know how, I, 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 I have a hard time seeing what, the next 50 years looks like for our planet you know it's and i know you do a lot of work in that field yeah. and that was one of the things too that you know as much as i love all the animals and i never want to see an animal harmed you know and i was a lot of the, a lot of the impetus behind me but the two things that got me to go you know completely plant-based were you know my own health was was you know the selfish version of it but it was also like most of the the stuff that made me just go i can't do this anymore was reading up about the environmental impact that animal agriculture has on on our world and just being like i can't, i know i'm just one person but i can't do this like yeah. i can't know what i know and go and like have a, a scoop of ice cream and not feel like a bag of dirt right you know these these fires could be the tipping point fires are a disaster wildfires in a few different ways first there's the loss of life and, and property. Uh, in Maui, there were probably a thousand deaths. You know, they, they, right now they're saying 850 or a thousand people missing. Um, and um, uh, then the fires bring carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And then you're losing the trees that suck down carbon dioxide so they're a triple threat and if they keep happening you know wildfires can beget wildfires uh, so it's so important we have to realize how dire the threat is and when you realize how dire the threat is then you say what can i do well is there anything so difficult about limiting yourself to eating human food is that really so hard? I mean, it is going to be hard, let's say, to get rid of the airline industry. That would be hard to do. Yeah. No one's going to travel any and fly anymore. That's hard. It's, it's difficult to have solar, uh, I mean, to have electric trucks. It can, we can get there, but that's difficult, these 18-wheelers. Mm -hmm. um, but we can all stop eating meat tomorrow that's not hard or yeah some people think it's hard but it is no but even even the 18 wheelers was interesting like the company that i uh i visited the the non-dairy company uh yoso they uh they have this one yogurt and they have them in these like they're not like the big square or the big tubs they're in these these slender kind of like you know pla not plastic these packages are really loose i'm like this is a weird yogurt container and she said yeah it's weird but you know what we need 80% less trucks to transport the same amount. Oh. And I was like, that's change right there. And that's a company right. going, how can we act? We still need to use the trucks, but how can we use less of them? Right. Right. But, you know, back to your, your comment about the wildfires, like this is the first year I remember being affected 
you know, as a Canadian by the wildfires, I know it's always been a thing that's plagued, you know, California and the States. And we always hear about the wildfires there. But this is the first time I've had, I've walked outside and went, oh, shit, our planet's on fire. Yes. And, and I can't and you can't ignore that anymore when you smell it and you right. can't and your kids can't go out and play, right. you know, uh, and, and you have to ask your and, and, you know, that's a conversation I have with other people, too. Like, I don't expect the world to go vegan overnight. Like, I know that's never going to happen, but I know that it's like it's not that hard to like cut down and and reduce. And I think like if everyone like, you know, you know, the stats as well as everyone, I'm sure. But it's like if if people just do that, if they just replace three meals a week. Like that would make a huge impact. Like they don't think they realize the amount that that would do, and it's not that much. Well, I'm not going to be satisfied with three meals. I'll no, you know, <laughs> but start with three. I'll say twenty one. Yeah, there you go. I I agree with that because it but, isn't hard. You see, that's that's my point. Is it's like the meatless Monday thing. Now I don't want to come down on meatless Monday. There are good people who promote meatless Monday, and I'll bet that there are. Lots of people who do Meatless Monday and then they go Meatless Tuesday and eventually they get there. Yeah, so I'm not against Meatless Monday, um, but the problem with Meatless Monday is that it makes it sound like, oh, this is going to be so difficult. Just try it on Monday. It isn't that difficult. No, and you know, you open a can of beans, you boil, so you put put rice in water and bring it to a low boil. And you got rice and beans. You put a corn tortilla in the toaster oven. You got a, a meal. And you yeah, can do a, a lot salsa. better than that. Go to pbnj.ca. Well, that's and that's where the name came from, PB with J. It was like I wanted something that would sound fun. You know, P, yeah. you know, plant based with Jeremy. It works with my name, but also like a peanut butter and jam sandwich is plant based. Yeah, you know, if, especially if you have a healthier jam and you're not using right. the, the peanut butter that's right. laced with sugar, that's a pretty health a, 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 you know whole wheat bread. That's a healthy comfort based meal and it just for me it spoke to the idea is like this food doesn't have to feel like homework it doesn't have to feel like a punishment to eat this way that you know you don't have to just be eating salads 21 meals a day that's not what it is right, right. so yeah. it was all about going you you can do this way in a way that's fun that nourishes your body that's close to the stuff you used to eat and you can enjoy it and have fun and your family can like it too so it's like pretty much all the stuff that i put on my website in particular is stuff that is approved by everyone in my family and if you've watched my youtube channel you know how picky my daughter is you know <laughs> so that's just stuff that it's just like that your kids you know give them to try it. i I, re I do realize that there is a transition people take to go through to re remove themselves from like the standard north american diet and the taste of too much fat and salt and sugar and it just takes a beat to, to realize how delicious a piece of corn is with nothing on it right you know uh, and that kind of or thing. a sweet potato that's just it. Like it takes a while for people to, to get that out of their system, but it's just like anything. It's just like, just do it for a couple of weeks. And I promise you, you'll never miss it. Right. And then right. once you start eating that stuff again, you, you'll know your body just knows instantly. Like I, I know that I'm sure you've maybe had a similar experience where it's like you go somewhere and they tell you all the food is plant-based, everything's great. And you have a sip of that soup and you know, right away that broth, there's something in there. Yeah. Like my, I know within seconds, and then my stomach tells me very quickly that it's like you just had a little bit of chicken broth or beef broth or right. whatever, you know, because our bodies are, you know, it, those are harsh things to put our bodies through and they'll, they'll process them when we're used to them. But when we're not, it's like you realize what a toll they take on you. And taste buds change. Yes. The palate adapts. 100%. So this is a failure of the imagination when people say, I could never eat that way. Well, you haven't tried it, and you try it for a week or two, and then you won't be able to eat the way you used to eat because your palate has improved. Yeah, I've, I've gotten that. Uh, I, I like food too much to eat the way you eat. And I say, I feel the exact same way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that was right but back at you. Our food is great. You know, it's just again, it's like once you once you decide you want to make a change, you, where the mind goes, the body follows and this and the taste buds too. And it just it just takes a beat and you have to want to because it's so easy to trick yourself into going like I just had someone I responded to my channel this morning about how well I just I've tried so much and all the plant based cheeses and blah, blah, blah. I just I, I, I know I'll never be able to give up cheese. And I'm like, well, if that's the way you feel. I agree. But you're right whether or not you think that way or you don't. Like you're going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if you decide you can give up cheese, you will. And if you decide right. that you'll never be able to, you won't. Like that's 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 on right. you. So don't tell me that you you'd love to be vegan but you can't. You don't want to be. 
Right. <laughs> well, here's my it. opinion on the cheeses, because I'll go into the local grocery store and they'll have a lot of vegan cheeses. Yeah. And every one of them stinks because they're all made with coconut oil and processed ingredients. Yep. And you may not, in most grocery stores, be able to find any decent uh, vegan cheese. But there are ones made from nuts. And the ones made from nuts without coconut oil can be pretty damn good. And I've had some artisanal vegan cheeses made with nuts that are quite good. Yeah, the cashew ones are quite good. I the one I use that I a recipe that I kind of tweaked and stumbled across over the years is just made with uh carrots and potatoes and little tahini and nooch. And it's just great because it starts off as a sauce, it thickens in the fridge and becomes a spread. And then if you freeze uh -huh. it, you can gra you can grate it, right? And it's it's still our go to and it's not the kind of thing that you you know it takes doesn't take twelve hours to make and ferment and all that kind of stuff. It's like you can make it in about a half an hour and you make a big batch. It'll last a long time. Right. Now, are you going to do a cookbook? You know what? A, a lot of people have asked me that in the last little bit. And it's, it's, it's something I've had in the back of my head for a long time. And I kind of wanted to get wait to the point where people were asking me before I just imposed it on the world. But it's definitely That's why I asked. Yeah. It's definitely something I, I, I want to do more more research into in the next little bit and, and because a lot of people are asking for it. So I, I foresee it in my future. Well, I think you should do it. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. So well, you've, you've had like, such great experiences in that realm, too, and your work with Chef AJ has been great. She's yeah. such a – I'm you know enamored by her. She, she is great. And, you know, when I first met Chef AJ, she was an overweight pastry chef. Uh, she was about 50 pounds overweight, and she had written a manuscript called Unprocessed. Uh, and she said, Glenn, would you help me with this? Because it needs a little help to really, you know, be publishable. Yeah. And uh, I said to myself, I, I looked at the manuscript, and I said, you know, this is going to be a lot of work. And... She's probably going to sell 10 copies a month at her pastry cooking classes. Yeah. And I thought, it's too much. You know, so I said, AJ, let me just give you some notes. And I, and I initially did that. And then she said, Glenn, I can't take all your notes. I'm a busy woman. Help me rewrite this. So I did. And then she became Chef AJ. Yeah. She lost the 50 pounds. She got an enormous following. Um, and, uh, and God bless her. She's just been such a great, um, source of energy and enlightenment for, for, for people. And she's helped make so many people healthy, uh, and go back 10 years when she was a 50 pound overweight pastry chef. I didn't see that coming. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, a, it's funny. It's like, I think we all, I, I'm the same way. If, if you told me, you know, 10 years ago, I'd, you know, be, you know, have a little plant-based following and, and be like in doing what I'm doing. I'd be like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> that's not your career trajectory. What are you doing? Like, it's, I think that's just what it is. I think one day for so many of us, the light bulb flicks on. It's, it's the allegory of the caves. We turn away and realize the shadows aren't real. And it's yeah. like, oh, there's another world out there. What have I been looking at this whole time? Yeah. And we can't unsee what we've seen. Right. right? You know, and I think that was me. It's like it's you know the Matrix, whatever, whatever allegory you want to use. It's if we realize, oh, there's another world out there that's actually the real one, and I can't unknow what I know now. And damn it! <laughs> right. Well, then let me ask you this final question: If you could go back and address 350-pound Jeremy Lalonde, what would you say to him? You know what? I wouldn't say a damn thing. I'd bring him a meal. Uh huh. I'd bring him a three-course meal and just say like. If you don't like this, that's fine. But I think I just also, I think if my, if 360 pound Jeremy could just see me physically and see how happy I am and how much energy I have, that's all it would take. Because I think maybe that version of me wouldn't, I don't think he would understand that this is possible. I think he would say that's, you're never going to have the time or the energy to put towards that version of yourself. And also, and it won't bring you the happiness that this other career should be bringing you.
But I got to tell you, and as much as I still love making TV and film and all that kind of stuff, the joy I get from this work, like this feels like it's feeling more and more like my my calling. Yes. You know, that it took 40 years to find. Yes. <laughs> I've gone through a similar career path and I know what you mean. But I still want to make movies. <laughs> yeah, that's just it. Well, there's that calling. There's the, the, and I think that's I think that's healthy. I think it's good for people that have diverse interests that and and and, and they can complement each other like mine have with you know my right. filmmaking bleeding into my youtube stuff right well jeremy it's been great getting to know you and talking with you and you can find him at pbnj.ca with j pb with j dot pb with j dot ca or at his youtube channel of the same name Jeremy Lalonde will also be looking for your films. And everyone, please subscribe and thank you for joining us. This has been the Glenn Mercer Show, where everyone listening turns vegan, regains their health, and annoys their friends and relatives. Find us on YouTube at the Glenn Mercer Show and across all your major podcast platforms. Don't forget to subscribe.